Today is the class is in memory of Jared Orchem, and we are going to learn about Simchas Torah. What is Simchas Torah? Simchas Torah will be this week. We have Shmini Atzeret and Simchas Torah. In the diaspora, it's two separate days. On Shmini Atzeret, we say Easter service. It will be Wednesday night and Thursday will be Shmini Atzeret. The eighth day. And Simchas Torah is the day we complete the Torah. It will be Thursday night, we will be dancing with the Torah. And Friday morning, we will actually complete the Torah. We will read the last parsha of the Torah, parsha the Zot Abracha, and we will read it. And then, the, and then when we finish that, we will right away take out another Torah, and we'll open another Torah, and we read from at the beginning, Bereshit. And what amazing is, and then in Judaism, we never stop. We finish. Now the person who finishes the Torah is called Chatan Torah. Chatan Torah means the, the groom of the Torah. The person who starts the first aliyah from Bereshit is called Chatan Bereshit. The groom of Bereshit of the beginning. Who is the bride? Talking about the groom, who is the bride? The bride is the Torah. The Torah is the bride and we are married to the Torah. In... Uh, don't close the door. Thank you. Then, Chatan Beresh, the, the, that's a tuch, uh, in, in, a, in a regular synagogue, this is considered the biggest honor. And people, you auction this out. Hello. Good evening. You, you auction this out, and you and you and it's considered a very big honor to complete the Torah or to begin the Torah. But uh, you know, uh, in our own generations, if they show up in shul, it's already a big honor. <laughs> now, when wh when it starts in Chas Torah, where it coming from? What's the holiday exactly? You look in the Bible; there is no in Chas Torah. I mean, Shmini Atzeres, yeah, the eighth day is in the Bible. After seven days of Sukkot, you celebrate another day. But it's not written in the Bible that you complete the Torah. It's not written by you have to dance with the Torah. None of it. You look in the Talmud, it's not even in the Talmud. It comes after the Talmud. It's probably the Geonic time, late, much later. One of the sources for Simchas Torah, that means to say Simchas Torah is not a biblical, a holiday, not a rabbinic holiday. Yes. Even more, it's not a holiday that was done because of a certain miracle. No, Pesach is because we came out of Egypt. Shavu is because of the miracle that God gave us the Torah. Sukkot is because the miracle that God took us out in the clouds of glory and protected us. Hanukkah is the miracle of the, of the oil. Purim is the miracle from Esther, from uh, saving us from Amen. Simchas Torah? What's Simchas Torah? Then the story of Simchas Torah begin. I mean, one of the proofs of Simchas Torah there was a was a was a, a man who lived in Spain. His name was Binyamin of Todela. Todela was a city in Spain, and he used to. He decided it was when he was 800 years ago, or something like this. He decided to travel all over the world and to record Jewish communities. It was what today we say, call it, I don't know, I don't know what you call it, there's a name for it. You go from community to community and you will discover what's going on. And he, for example, writes about the Falashi Jews, the Ethiopians. He traveled, I think, for 13 years, 12 or 13 years. And he wrote a book, it's called Masaot Binyamin, The Travelings of Benjamin. And there he writes that he came to a city in Egypt I think it was Cairo, I think, Cairo or Alexandria, one of the, and which city came? Um, okay, it doesn't like clear which place exactly. In any case, he came to, Jew to Egypt, and he found two synagogues, surprise, surprise. 
that one does walk into the other synagogue. There was a synagogue of the people, the Isra Israelites, the people from Israel, and there was the Babylonian Jews. Now in general, after the destruction of the first temple, Jews were exiled to Babylon, right? And the first were exiled, the prophet Yechezkel, and they established a very strong Jewish community. Every Jew walked in, joined the crowd, you understand? The first people who come to a country, the way they set it up, that's where it's going to go. In America, the first Jews who came here were not traditional Jews. That anybody who came after uh, adjusted himself to going there. Oh, in America it's different. Oh, in America you don't have to keep Shabbos. Oh, in America, I came a Jew from Europe with his thousands in film, and he has like a big bag of food and he wants to. So no, his, his friends or his family will give it him in Ellis Island. No, no, no. That's not, in America things are different. No, we don't do this. We don't do it. It's going to fight in the whole world. Don't do, don't do. The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, when he started, he came to America, he coined the phrase, America is no different. You are a Jew in Europe, you'll be a Jew in America too. We had the Shivas in Europe, we'll have the Shivas in America too. No such thing as no, 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 America, because the, the statement was, America is different. America thinks are different. Yeah, it's not going to work. Here. When he went off the, the boat, he announced the first day, in the, in the airport, in the, where we, it was off the boat, it was not the airport, it was right there on the port, he announced that he's opening a yeshiva. The same day, two of his biggest supporters brought him to America with a lot of money, told him, Rebbe, they came into it, Rebbe, we don't want to, we don't want you to be embarrassed, you know, it's not going to work here. It's just not going to work. You know, people tell you, yeah, 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 they get excited for five minutes, but America is a place that people get excited very fast, and they cool off very fast. Then it just... They said that night he was, when he, before he went to sleep, he was kind. He was thinking to himself, if my biggest supporters tell me it's not going to work. But he didn't change his mind because of this. He was right. In Babylon, the Jews came to, Yechezkel, the prophet, and the, big, the, the rabbis, the elite of Jerusalem was exiled before the destruction of the first temple. They set up shop in Babylon the right way. That Babylon established a strong Jewish community and they became stronger and stronger, they overpowered the original Jew Israeli community. In Israel, the word Tzores was much harder to be a Jew, that the learning was also suffered from it. Where in Babylon, they, they enjoyed relatively freedom, relative freedom that they were able to establish the Shivas and Judaism flourished. That the Israel, Israelites, the Israelis did not like the Iraqi Jews. The Babylonian Jews were second class citizens. Treated terribly. There are stories in the, in the Talmud you hear so stand. Hillel, the famous Hillel, was a, was a, 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 came from Iraq, from Babylon. I did so, I'm like, who? Oh, nobody. Finally, they needed a rabbi, it was not a rabbi. Oh, oh, <laughs> if you have no choice, you have to take him. But then in, back to Egypt, there were two shoes the Israeli Jews and the Babylonian Jews. And both of them had two customs how to read from the Torah. The Israeli Jews used to read the Torah every parsha in three weeks. Let's say the first parsha Bereshit. We're going to start it this week. This Saturday they would read a third of the parsha. Next Saturday the second third of the parsha. Next Saturday the third third of the parsha. They would finish one parsha in three weeks. The second parsha would take another three weeks. There is 55 parshas, 54 parshas. Then it's 165 Saturdays. It took three and a half years around roughly, to finish the, the whole Torah. Not like there is in some synagogues that they read a third of the Parsha, but they skip from Parsha to Parsha. The problem with this is you never hear the story. You read about how, how God created heaven and earth, fine, yeah, yeah. And then you read and Noah, where is Noah coming from? <laughs> Who created Noah? How is he in the picture? But if, you would, if at least they would read the Torah in order, they would be much better. In any case, that was the Israeli custom. Then he writes it was a Babylonian custom to finish the Torah in one year, to read every Shabbos a full parsha. Then this idea of finishing the Torah in one year is relatively a new story. Even 800 years ago, there were still Jews who were holding on to the other tradition. That's the way we did it. That's the way. Over the time, the Babylonian Jews won almost everything. With the argument with Israeli Jews that the, the center of Judaism was in Babylon and pay the money, <laughs> dedicate rabbis, 
And the Israelis were fighting and fighting and fighting. Basically, what happened is the Israeli, the Jewish community in Israel was dwindled down to nothing. For a thousand years, there was almost no Jews in Israel. Mm -hmm. Then it was only Babylon. Then from there comes the whole idea of reading the Torah in one year. From Babylonian Jews. And, and therefore, when you finish the Torah in one year, when you, finish the, when you read the Torah, you finish the Torah, it's a time to celebrate. That's why we celebrate the Simchas Torah. But the real question is, let's say you finish the Torah in one year. Fine, the Torah should be in one year. But why Simchas Torah? Wouldn't it be better to start the Torah right after Rosh Hashanah and to finish it right before Rosh Hashanah? That would make sense. Why Simchas Torah? What do you think? What does that to do with Hashan Rabba? Then let's learn about a certain mitzvah in the Torah. Almost by the end, end, almost by then, not by then, but almost by then. Um, it's in Parshas Vayelech, I think. Page 371. Actually, we'll start to page 370. That gives us better the context of the story. In top of page 370, number 7. Go ahead. Moshe called Yehoshua mm -hmm. and said to him, As all of Israel watched, be courageous and bold, for you shall enter with this people into the land that Adonai swore to their forefathers to give them, and you will apportion it to them. And Adonai is the one who is going ahead of you. He will be with you, will not enfeeble you, and will not abandon you. Do not fear and do not quake. Moshe wrote this Torah and gave it to the Kohanim, descendants of Levi, who carry the, the Ark of Adonai's covenant, and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses called Joshua and told them, Be strong and courageous. Don't give up. God is with you. And he gave the Torah. He wrote down the Torah. And he gave it to the children of Levites. Later he gave, before he died, he gave every tribe. But clearly he gave it to the Levites. Then Moses gives them an interesting law, an interesting mitzvah. Go ahead. Moses commanded them, saying, After seven years have ended, on the holy day of the Shemitah year, during the Sukkot festival. Okay. You know, this here is a Shemitah year. This is the beginning of a Shemitah year. But here he's speaking about, in the end, he, what he's talking about is the end of the Shemitah year. End of next year, so to speak. Sukkot of next year. Go ahead. When all of Yisrael comes to be seen in the presence of Adonai your God, in the place that he chooses, you shall read this Torah facing all of Yisrael for them to hear. When the, front, when the whole Jewish people used to come to see every holiday, they had to come to the temple, right? Then you should, you should, you should read the Torah to, to them. Here it's written that you should, you should read the Torah to them almost every time, but soon we'll see what is going on here. Number 12. Assemble the people, the men and the women, in, the infants, and your convert who is in your towns in order for them to hear and in order for them to learn, to fear Hashem, your God, that they will make sure to fulfill and the statements of this Torah. Okay, very good. Here is a mitzvah, it's called Akil. Akil is a mitzvah to assemble, to gather the old Jewish people. To do what? It says whom? Men, women, and infants. There is no other mitzvah that infants are involved are obligated to, to be a part of it. Do you recall anywhere in the Torah about infants? Not children, uh, other than circumcision. <laughs> circumcision, you're right. <laughs> it's only boys. <laughs> you're right, it is everybody. And you convert. Who is your convert? What's convert means? Convert is not a kind of converted stranger. person. A stranger. A stranger means you know, in Israel, could be they could they could accept Gentiles who believe in God and accept the seven Noahide laws. Even this guy is invited. 
to come what? The convert that's in you, uh, uh, who is in your town, in order for them to hear and in order for them to learn, to fear Hashem. Means this event is to hear and learn to fear God. And they will make sure to fulfill all the statements of the story. Look, Rashi, number 12. The man. The man. To, to learn. To learn. The women. To, to listen. listen. And the infants. Why did they come? To bring merit to those who brought them. Okay. Because the Talmud, that's a question. Infants? Why infants? But I think the Torah really gave the answer. So they should learn to learn to fear God. Every holiday, three times a year, we had to go to, his, to, go to Jerusalem. Men, according to some opinion, who had one land in Israel. Only men and only one land. How many people came? And then there is a few too old in your two days. You have many, many excuses not to come. Once in seven years, there was no excuses. Everybody had to show up, no matter who you are. Men, women, children, babies, infants. You're slapping a baby that was born two months ago from Tzfat to Jerusalem. If, it would be, if it's not dangerous, you have an obligation to bring him to the temple. For what? The question is, what does he understand? The older kid, you can say, they learn, they understand, they will fear God, they'll remember the experience. But babies, to reward bring, the people who bring them. For reward, you can bring many people, you can give many opportunities for reward. Obviously, there is something here. And then it continues in number 13. And their children who did not understand will hear and will learn to fear Hashem, your God, all the years that you are living on the land that you are crossing the garden there to inherit. Okay. You're bringing all the to learn, to listen. You can imagine the whole Jewish people is coming to the temple. What's going on? There? A balagan. Baby, it's a kind. Who is listening? Who is saying? Before the days of microphones and speakers, you don't learn, you don't hear, you don't... Gurnished. You're busy with your baby, is crying on your end. You're not going anywhere. You're not learning anything. I can, I can sign on it from experience. I'm telling you, you don't learn anything. Then what was the Akel? Akel was a special thing by the end of Shemitah, the end of the sabbatical, once in seven years. <coughs> the whole nation came together and the king used to get on a special um, platform, special stage. He used to stand, or some, if he was a king from the house of David, he used to sit there and read chapters from the book of Deuteronomy. Akel was an experience of Mount Sinai all over again. That's what Akel. <coughs> Re-experiencing, re-enacting Mount Sinai. And by Mount Sinai, who was there? Everybody was there, right? Mm -hmm. Men, women, and children. Everybody came to Mount Sinai. Because it was not about what was in Mount Sinai. God said the Ten Commandments. Is anything new in the Ten Commandments? Oh, the Jewish people say, oh, do not kill. Oh, really? Wow, do not kill. Wow, that's really news. I never heard about that. I thought you have to kill. Cain and Abel, Cain killed Abel, right? One of the arguments, the Spiracious, right? Cain, why? It's written in the Bible, Cain killed Abel. Then God told Cain, I will protect you. Anybody who will kill you will be punished. What do you care? God had to kill him. Shofer dam adam be adam, damoi shofer. If a person spills blood, right there it's written. His blood should be spilled. Basically, you should be punished with, a person should be punished with death. Then who is the first one to kill? Cain. That Cain, instead of being killed, so to speak, God protected him. God said, anybody who will kill you will be killed. It's not fair. And the Medrash said something amazing. Cain said to God, yeah, I, want to, I was angry with Abel. I want to beat him up. But then I saw him laying on the floor. He said, Abel, Abel, get up. He's not moving. I never knew that you can kill a person. It's almost like a child who sees the first time experience, experience somebody dying. He suddenly did this man a minute before with his open eyes. Then a minute later, it closed us. And that's it. Cain had a great argument. Cain said, what do you want from me? I didn't know what this means. And therefore God said, you're right. We cannot punish you. You didn't know. And that's a great lesson of encouragement and defending 
the Jewish people of our generation. You cannot be angry with anybody. 95% of the Jewish people were not born in religious homes. They don't know anything. They don't, I mean, knowing in a way that you are raised with that, that's what I mean to know. Anything that comes to you as an adult is already something, it's a secondary thing, it's not you. You cannot blame anybody for anything. You didn't know, what do you want to know? The new result only can be blamed. The religious boys, religious kids who were born in religious homes. If anybody, it's them. But anybody else cannot be, cannot be, cannot be blamed for anything. Then this is, then, that was, uh, um, I, then, then what was not to kill, that from the beginning, not to kill was something everybody knew. They came to the Ten Commandments, do not kill. Oh, that was profound, God. Whoa. <laughs> do not steal. Oh, that's, I never heard this. To a point, the Jewish people could almost be disappointed. The whole Moses built up the, the excitement. But it wasn't about the information, it was about the experience. They heard God. They made a commitment to God. They had the fear of God, the love of God. It was a person walked away from Mount Sinai. It became clear that there is a God and we have to live by, by his rules. The details don't make a difference. The same thing is in Akel. Akel was not something that you do. It was not for the information. What the king did, he read from the book of Deuteronomy. I can sit in my, on my couch and read the book of Deuteronomy too, but I need the king to read it for me. And could be in some cases the people, other people could read much better than the king. I'm telling you, there were kings who were not. The reading skills were not 150%. But it's the experience, the old Jewish people recommits themselves to Judaism. That was so special. And for this, just like on Mount Sinai, you need to have everybody Men, women, children, old, young, everybody. The same thing was every once in seven years was at least a, a, was really a Mount Sinai experience. That's Akel. Now in the in the diaspora, we do not have. A, I mean, after the destruction of the temp, first, first temple, Akel is like is like the is like the jubilee. Only when the majority of the Jewish people are there, you 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 are obligated to observe the mitzvah of Akel. What the Rebbe used to say, that the concept of Akel, what's the concept of Akel? Gathering people and speaking to them about God, about the fear of God, about the commitment to Judaism. The Rebbe said, that has to be done every year, every seventh year. Then the year after the sabbatical, the Rebbe called it a year of Akel, not just one-time experience. And he encouraged many gatherings, as many gatherings as possible. People come together and recommit themselves to Judaism. And the experience when you have many people together is much stronger when you have it by yourself. You know, the joy, if you have a wedding of 10 people, or you have a wedding of 100 people, where is the greater joy? 100 people or 200 people? The greater the crowd is, the more the excitement is in the air. The same thing when, the same thing when we see, when we learn about, uh, when we take the commitment about God, a Mount Sinai, it's written, if it would be missing one Jew, the Torah wouldn't be given. God wanted everybody there. You now somebody is a big family. They're making a reunion. If one didn't show up, he killed it. Yeah, it was everybody there. Almost everybody. One was missing. So one, who cares? A hundred of the family members were there. Who cares? No. One was missing. It's still not this. That's what the whole idea of Akim. Then the Abar Banel, Abar Banel, Don Isaac Abar Banel, he was um, the finest minister in, in uh, Spain, right? And he wrote a commentary to the Bible. It's interesting, he was the finest minister in Spain during his time of the expulsion of Spain. He chose us, we think, oh, we have connection. The finest minister, the whole academy in Spain was dependent on him. He threw out all the Jews. He lived at the same time as Maimonides? After the Sp Spanish expulsion was 500 years ago. 1492. 1492. <laughs> <laughs> Very famous date, exactly. My mind is lived 800 years ago. Then it's a few hundred years after that. He wrote a commentary to the Bible. And he writes there something very interesting. He writes that he read in books, that's what he writes, that every, every Sukkot, the king, you know, there's five books of Moses. You know that the five books of Moses are also divided into seven books? 
There is one book of two lines, you know, in 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 Baalotcha. Vayi bin So Aaron, you know this line. Vayi bin So Aaron, vayomer Moshe. This comes from the from the book of Bamidbar. In the parshas Baalotcha, and there there is a written that this is considered a book by itself. Basically, the five books of Moses are in a certain calculation divided into seven books. He says that the king who used to read every Sukkot, some of the Torah, a book, let's say, from the seven books, came the, the Shemitah, by the end of the Shemitah, by the eighth year, by the Sukkot of the eighth year, he completed the Torah, therefore he read it the Torah enemy, even the day, Jewish law says he didn't read all the way to the end of the Torah enemy, but he says he basically completed the Torah. That in a certain way, it was Simchas Torah already in biblical time. You understand what I'm saying? Not every year, once in seven years. But it was the concept of completing the Torah, and how they did it in a big event, in a big to-do. That's how it was done. He says, this is the source for Simchas Torah. Why the rabbis chose to finish the Torah by the end of Sukkot, so to speak? Because Akel used to be a Sukkot. That they connected the same, because in Akel, the king used to kind of finishing the Torah and make a big celebration. They said it would be the right way to finish the Torah by the end of Sukkot and make a big celebration. Is that because Sukkot is kind of the finishing holiday, so to speak? To yes. Okay. And it's a finishing holiday, and it's a time of celebration. It's rejoicing. Sukkot is a time of rejoicing. Then the time to finish the, to finish the, the and because they used to do it then in the Bible, even it's not the same thing, not even close, but still something. Once in seven years, the Torah was celebrated. Then that's the time to celebrate the Torah. And just like in Akhil, everybody used to come, men, women, and children. So to Ansim Chas Torah, when we come to celebrate the Torah, we need to have everybody. And just as in Akil, it wasn't a matter of how much you learn and how much you understand. There is a strange thing about Simchas Torah. In the night, right? We don't read from the Torah. We take out the Torah, wrapped. What? A person says, oh, you're rejoicing the Torah. Open it and learn from it. No. We're closing it. We dance around with it. First of all, the whole idea that people dance with a book of law is a strange idea. You ever saw somebody dancing with the Constitution? Another religion that dance with their books, never saw such a thing. They, they revere it, but they don't dance with it, don't celebrate with it. The secret of the Jewish people is found in Simchas Torah. Because the Jewish people, as we said in the beginning, created the holiday. It wasn't the holiday that was in the Bible, it wasn't in Talmud. We created it. We wanted a day to celebrate with the Torah, to rejoice with the Torah. Isn't strange, Jews, after so much suffering over the 2,000 the two years, would have today a day of fasting, not a day of celebration. They celebrate it. Are you crazy? What are you celebrating it? Because it's a love story. The secret for our survival is in Torah. And that's why I mentioned that many times in America, when, a, when all the Jews go to show, and you keep on, you come to show. First of all, you're hungry. Then there is long service that the chaz makes you a hole in your head. And then the rabbi goes on and on and on and on and on. When you leave the show, you're not coming back. The only time you come back is again you keep when you must you feel you must to come back. Like once a guy told me in show, Rabbi, every time I hear the same song. I told him what's the song? It was Nicole Nitri. <laughs> <laughs> he was making it as a joke, but the joke fitted him, you know what I mean? He's a guy, he's a Kolnitri Jew type of thing. In Russia, the Jews used to come to celebrate Asim Torah. In St. Petersburg, in Moscow, thousands of Jews used to come in the 60s and the 70s. Thousands, the streets were packed with Jews. If you come to Simchas Torah, what's Simchas Torah? No speeches, no reading from the Torah, no long services, drinking and dancing. Oh, that's a holiday you want to, be, you want to belong to. That's a nation you want to be a part of. And then they came again and again. Then really the Judaism, the idea of Simchas Torah is the secret of the Jewish people. That we on our own created a holiday to celebrate, to celebrate the Torah. 
Jews don't, uh, other nations don't celebrate with a book of law. The people, there is lawyers, there is judges, they celebrate, they dance with it. They kiss it, they hug it. Because for us, it's more than just a book. It's, it's our life. That's what Simchas Torah is all about. And, for the, and that's why it's not like in Akel, it wasn't about how much you hear, how much you didn't hear. Who cares? Nobody heard the word. The, 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 the king was there, and sometimes probably an old king was reading. Nobody heard anything. Thousands of people, kids crying. But you were, were you in Akel or were you not there? Nobody asked you at Mount Sinai, what did you learn? You were at Mount Sinai or you were not at Mount Sinai? That's a question. You were there or you were not there? And that's what Simchas Torah is all about. Coming together and celebrating and getting excited about it all. That's, that's the, I think, I mean, this idea that this, the link between Simchas Torah and, and Hakel is an amazing uh, idea that the Barbanel came up with. And I just found that today somebody brought it down. And I discovered that it's unbelievable, the connection between these two. And it explains, always bothered me, why, why, why in Sukkot? You finish the Torah in one year, but why, you did, why not in Shavuos? Shavuos would be the time to complete the Torah. Why Sukkot? Because the time to celebrate the Torah, the time to rejoice it, they, in, the, in the temple is to come together, that was in Sukkot, that was the holiday to do it. Now, there is another thing about it. There are three holidays, Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. We mentioned that in other occasions, that on Pesach, it's not written to celebrate. It's not written the word rejoicing, Pesomachto. It's written, it's a holiday, but the Hashem doesn't say in the Torah that you have to rejoice yourself on Pesach. On Shavuos, it's written one time you have to rejoice yourself. And Sukkot, it's written three times you have to rejoice yourself. Why is it? Pesach is the time that you sowed your fields, right? That's the beginning of the, of the season. Well, it's time to rejoice. You're just starting. You're not celebrating. Let's see how things work out. Then we'll celebrate. We're just beginning. Who knows how the year has gone? Shavuot is the time of the harvest. You cut the, the produce from the field. You're more happy, but you're in the middle of the work. You're... You don't have a day, you don't have a night. So cold and everything is in the storage house. And you're getting ready for the winter and you look back and you see the whole... That's a time for rejoicing. That's why in Sukkot it's written three times rejoicing. That's why when you look for a time to make Simchas Torah, when you want to rejoice at the Torah, when, when people have patience to rejoice, have a net for rejoicing is when everything is taken care of. In life, we have also three stages. Pesach is compared to the, is the birth of the Jewish people. That's how the prophet describes it. Ezekiel, he describes the, the, the birth of the Jewish people. Uh, Pesach is the birth of the Jewish people. We were, we were, we were created as a nation. Leida Tam Israel. In a life, in the life of a human being, when he's born, we celebrate, right? But not too much. You know why? Because you don't know how this little baby will grow up. Would it be go? Will it be a benefit for humanity, or it will be a a pain, or it will grow up to be a gangster? We don't know what's going to be with them. That's why it's not written rejoicing on Pesach. Shavuos, what would be Shavuos compared in the life of a human being? Bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah. Shavuos, we received the Torah, we made a commitment. Na seven ishma, right? We will listen, we will do. That's a bar mitzvah boy, gets up to the Torah, and he gives a speech, and he says, I will do, I will commit, and everybody tells him, you are now joining the, the army of Hashem, and you make a commitment. It's a time to rejoice. But you know what? I would make such a big party, because <laughs> commitment is nice. Let's see how, how he pays it off, the commitment. What's Sukkot? What happened between Shavuos and Sukkot by the Jewish people? In Jewish history, after they received the Torah, golden calf. Yeah. Golden. the golden calf. Golden calf was a crisis, a huge crisis. The Jewish people worshipped idols. But what happened after that? They repented. Then Sukkot is after the repentance experience, so to speak, after Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. You went through a crisis, 
you survive that, and you're moving on, and your commitment is even stronger. Now is a time for rejoicing. Now it's a time for celebration in a person's life. In a person, you know, in a marriage, yeah, the wedding is very nice, everybody's so happy and so cute and so beautiful. But then when you go to a crisis and you survive the crisis and you still move on, that's, 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 the, that's the time that you can say that you really, your commitment is true. And that's why Sukkot is a time of rejoicing and that's why Simchas Torah, that's all the explanation why Simchas Torah is by the end of Sukkot. Because it's the, three, the whole three seasons, the whole three holidays. Of, you know, the, the first holiday in the Jewish calendar, the first holiday is Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. You, when you pass Sukkot, by the end of Sukkot, you, look, you can look back, you cross the bridge, and you're still around. Now it's time to celebrate. And that's really what, what, the, what the Simchas Torah is all about. The Simchas Torah is a very, it's a very exciting holiday. Now by Hasidim, we will do a kafot, we will dance with the Torah, not only on Thursday night, here we will have also dancing on Wednesday night with the three and a half people showing up, we will dance with them. <laughs> not such a long dancing because people are, you know, are not made you know, for, two, for two nights of dancing, but in a Hasidic synagogue, everywhere in the world, there will be a kafot on Shmini at Sarah's night, then there will be a kafot on Simchas Torah, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday morning, three times. Because the more you love the Torah, the more you're excited about it, the more opportunities you look to dance with it. And we used to go on Simchas Torah, we used to go, the Rebbe used to send out and send go all over the world to all different synagogues. We used to walk for three, four hours to come to a synagogue, usually in a regular synagogue, a Simchas Torah night, and since small synagogue in Queensway in Queens or in, uh, in Brooklyn somewhere, in, um, a, few, a few older people come to show, they take out the Torahs. They make one circle. <laughs> oh, I'm tired. Let's go home. <laughs> Used to come in, 10 or 15 young people, and revive the place. And the Rebbe said, the Rebbe, this was the mission, to go to Jews and to bring them the joy of Simchas Torah to that community. It's to walk hours and then walk back hours because it's Yontef. Sometimes you got eggs and us. I myself got once an egg while we were walking from, from one of the of the apartments. You know where, where it's coming. Right? And you're in your own suit and everything. Sometimes it was raining for hours. You used to walk in the rain. For hours, you come back, you're black hat, your whole face is black. Everything can go straight to the garbage. Worthless. Once the Rebbe gave Lechaim to everybody who came, who came, who went, went to the Taluch, it's called. And a guy came with a dry head, the Rebbe asked him, how is your head dry? <laughs> he said he went on to change it. Okay, he gave him <laughs> <laughs> He changed it already. He, he, he was quick. But the Rebbe was very important because he said that that's our commitment to go. That's, that's how you train yourself to be in the army of God. Like there is a training period. When you're going to the army, you cannot be in, in a bad time in the army. Yeah, I joined the army of God, really. But then by going to, but bringing the joy of Simchas Torah to other Jews, it was like, and the more you have excitement, that's what, that's what Hasidim are all about, that they get excited about, about the Torah, and the joy of the Torah, that's what kept the Jewish people going. The Simchas Torahs, not the Yom Kippur, the Simchas Torahs. We are not against Yom Kippur, we are all for it. <laughs> it's a very good night, a very important day to be, a lot of Jews come to show. But the excite, the love, the joy of the Torah, that was, kept, that was the fuel for the Jewish people. What's the connection between Simcha's Torah and, and Ezra's reading of the Torah? Who says there is a connection? I just don't know. When Ezra read the Torah? In Rosh Hashanah, no? I'm not sure. He later told them, go home and eat, and because it's a day of rejoicing to Hashem, right? They cried, and he told them, it was Rosh Hashanah. Ezra actually read the Torah in Rosh Hashanah, I'm almost sure. He only read it one time, right? It was a one event. It was like an Akil event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gathered everybody, he told them the rules, and they all cried, and they all recommitted themselves to Judaism. I mean, why do you think there is no command in the Torah itself to, to read the Torah on a regu you know, more regular basis? It's, uh, that's actually, there is written, you should learn the Torah, and you should not forget, and you should do it. And, Constantly. Yeah. Yeah. That's from the Torah. 
I mean, there's no set kind of regular readings like we have today uh, in that sense. It's written that Moses established for the Jewish people that shouldn't be three days without Torah. That's why we read the Torah on Mondays, on Thursdays, and on Shabbos. Yeah, I was just going to ask that it's curious that, that two different patterns would develop, reading the Torah, you know, um, a third of the, of the Parsha, getting through a Parsha in three weeks, mm -hmm. and get, getting through a Parsha in one week. I mean, that, that seems odd to me that there would be that kind of a deviation. I, I mean, it's not, I'll tell you, Moses said every three days you should learn Torah, but Moses didn't say which Parsha, you understand? Okay. As long as you learn Torah, you're covered. Okay. This is Ezra, this huh? Is, go ahead, I'm sorry. Ezra made it, it should be three alias. That every Monday in Thursday should be at least three alias. Three people should be called up to the Torah. And, uh, and on Shabbat you should, read, uh, you should have seven alias. But uh, the idea of three, every three days, it's written, the Jewish people walked for three days and they couldn't find water. The Torah is compared to water. You cannot survive three, three days without water, so too you cannot survive three days without the Torah. The, the idea is to have the Torah for three days. But I think the Babylonian custom, because the original custom was also, I don't think that the idea of in three and a half years finishing the Torah started with Moses. It was later, you understand what I'm saying? That how in Babylon they started to read the, the, whole, the whole Torah in one, one year? Maybe they felt that people forget. Three and a half years is too long, you understand? When you come to three and a half years, three and a half years later, especially by the life of young children, young people, mm -hmm. is like a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Noah? Who is Noah? <laughs> what? Ah! Oh! So, so by I mean, short of obviously there weren't any fax machines there, or emails. So obviously you have to disseminate that and that recommendation. Oh, little by little, yeah. So I remember that there was a uh, this goes back a couple decades that there uh, it might have been the Ethiopian Jews or it might have been a a group in in India who claimed to be Jewish mm -hmm. and the Israelis uncovered th this and. One of the ways they knew that they were authentic is they just said, you know, let's go with them to Shul on Shabbos mm -hmm. and see which Parsha they're going to read. And the Parsha that they were going to read was on target. Was it really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's an interesting story. I never heard it. Wow. You're right. If you read the right Parsha, you are for sure on target. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but even if, you would, if they would read the Parsha, the Torah, even if they wouldn't read exactly the same Parsha, if they can read the Nebo, the, the Torah, they are on target. But it's, 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 it's interesting. But I think it was no more than that. The Israelis were all done to their cause. People were very, Jewish people, people are very ze jealous for the customs. That's one of the secrets, by the way, of survival. You know, it's a strange thing. We have so many different customs. It creates so many fights. Mm -hmm. Wish I, the rabbis, didn't get together, said, like, let's wipe it all out. It's not done. Everybody the same and finish. Be one big happy family. You know why? Because if I and we all of us have the same custom, Hey, don't bother. Oh, don't. We're like the churches with 30,000 people in a church. Everybody's in. Everybody said, stand up, stand up, sit down, sit down, finish. But if I know that I have a custom that you guys don't have, and my father tells me, you custom, you better preserve it because nobody, all these guys, they don't understand. We do it. Then I have something that it's so dear to me. I know if I will not do it, it will be forgotten. My commitment to my custom my fighting for my custom, that's what keeps me going. And that's why it was so important, even it create fights among the Jewish people. It still worth it. Because the excitement that people have for their custom, and not for your custom, that's what keeps going. And, and, and therefore, even when the Babylonian Jews decided to do it once a year, I can see the Israeli Jews saying, oh, you don't know. My father was reading this way, my giga. You know, when the Jew, you know, there is in Israel now that's a particular year. Jews were never in Israel. After World War II, thousand, even before World War II, Jews came to Israel in the, in the territories and before he started to settle the land. The rabbis told him, no, this year is a sabbatical. He looked on his phone, he looked on the rabbi, sabbatical. And my father was a farmer in Poland. I never heard of such a thing. What are you talking about? There is many other laws to give tithe on the food and so on and on. The first three, the first three years you can have tithe on the food. Many, many laws are... Some of them apply in the, in, the, in the diaspora, but most of them don't. That it was a hard way, hard, very hard thing to convince the Jews who made Aliyah to Israel that, that, that there is things that they don't know because it was not practiced in the, in the diaspora. They said the rabbi is making up stories, he's just giving us another time. 
I never heard that. I went to shul all my life. I never heard of such a thing. And usually, if you never heard, if you went to shul all your life and you never heard of such a thing, your judgment is the right judgment. But if you are coming to a different place and it's in, just in the Asper, I never used it, then you don't know from there. Then I, it's not surprising to me that the Jews sold them to three and a half years across them. But you need it at once a year. You know, I see it here in Hebrew school. The kids are, I hear passes. Abraham, I look at you like, huh? No, yeah, oh, I hear it. Oh, then the guy from the flood, it does not Oh, Abraham Lincoln, I mean, they don't know. <laughs> then I think, I think that this was the logic of the Babylonian custom. And three and a half years is too far. Are you stretching it out? You forget everything. And think about that. We, we learn that every year, again and again and again. And we every year find new things. Mm -hmm. People who learn for 60 years, since the Cheder, since day one, they learn the Parsha. Every year they discover new things. Every day they discover new things. And that's, that's what Simchas Torah is all about. And that's why we are so excited. We are so lucky that God gave us the Torah. I could give, choose, choose another nation, give it to somebody else. That when a person wakes up in the, mo in the morning and thinks that he is a part of the nation who received the Torah, there is 7 billion people in the world. From this, there is 13 million Jews, 14 million, 15 million Jews. Then we got inherited in the Torah. And God gave us to share it with the rest of the world, but He gave it to us. And from these 13 million Jews, there is maybe half of them who know that there is, I mean, more oriented with the Torah. And we are one of them, that really a Jew, when he wakes up in the morning and he remembers that he, who he is, and to jump out of bed with his pajamas and begin dancing. Or because you think people think you're a Michigan, or your wife think you went out of your mind. <laughs> Therefore, we don't do it. But really, that's how it would have to be. Then, uh, then this is Simcha's Torah, is the time to express the joy and the love and the gratitude we have to God for giving us the Torah.